Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. Great to have you along with us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. My name is Matt Kirkner. I am your host, and if there are three things I love talking about on our podcast. Number one, it is manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. That was the world that I lived in for more than 20 years, leading American manufacturing companies. Number two, we love talking about data. We are living in an era where there is more data available to manufacturers and to all of us than ever before. Believe it or not, most manufacturers only using about 12% of the data that is available to them. The third thing is continuous improvement, process improvement, personal improvement. How do we take ourselves and our organizations and make them better every year, every month, every week, and every day? Today, we get to talk about all of this with our guest. He is Anthony Murphy, who is the Vice President of Product Management for Plex Systems. Anthony, welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast. Well, I appreciate you having me. Great to, great to be here. Looking forward to it. So for our audience members, Anthony, who may not be completely familiar with Plex, tell us a little bit about your company and your technology. So Plex is a, a smart manufacturing platform a suite of solutions purpose built for manufacturers. And, and we were actually born out of a manufacturing organization. So if you go all the way back to where the company started, uh, it, the original founder was an engineer inside of a manufacturing organization, and they needed to have a better quality, better traceability, and, and to the point you made, Matt, you know, better access to data. And so he built a solution that harmonized everything that happened inside the of the four walls of the of the shop. And they're like, holy cow, we went from you know being uh, one of the worst suppliers to one of the best. And so like this this technology, there's something there. And so that's where where Plex came from. And so our our sort of uh, mission is to you know meet manufacturers where they are and help start them on their sort of digital transformation journey. And that could be as easy as, hey, look, I just need to visualize something like OEE to uh, quality management solutions to full-blown manufacturing execution. And even when we think about uh, running the full plant and, and coordinating the supply chain with ERP and our supply chain solutions. And so, um, you know, we think of ourselves as manufacturers and we have built the software for manufacturing. And so, um, you know, it's all about how do we deliver uh, better insights and help our customers be be more competitive uh, using our products. You know, necessity being the mother of all invention. Here we have an engineer that is coming up with a solution um, internal to manufacturing. And, and when you think about so many innovations in manufacturing, it, it, almost every one of them comes from somebody in the middle of the manufacturing environment, needing to solve a problem, coming up with a really, really creative solution to the problem. And then, you know, now here you have this global company that is born out of a single engineer needing to solve a problem in a single manufacturing operation. Really fascinating from that standpoint. The other thing that you said that's fascinating, and, and you know, we think about, we talk, we're talking to companies like Rockwell Automation, big multi-billion dollar international companies. A lot of the guests that we have on the podcast are individuals who, who are running or working at, at very high levels in organizations like that. But in so many ways, the digital transformation that you reference is really you know, the, the large companies, they have a solution, right? They've got a team of 10, 20, 30, 50 people working on their transformation. If I'm running a smaller to mid-sized manufacturing company, 10, 25, $50 million, I don't necessarily have that expertise on staff. When you talk about meeting a client where they are, is is that what you're talking about? Is how we, how we help not just the large multinational conglomerates, but small to mid-sized manufacturers with this digital transformation? Yeah, you know, the company we came out of was a was a small to mid-sized manufacturer. And that's sort of been in our DNA. And now we have scaled up and we run, you know, some of the largest organizations across the world. But part of the model, uh, and we are a multi-tenant software as a service. And so it doesn't require this tremendous amount of IT infrastructure or, you know, armies of systems integrators to come in and, and deploy and configure this stuff. It really is lightweight, but it's elastic. So it can be, you know. You got five people or five thousand people. It can it can meet the needs and and the way we build both the product as well as we think about you know implementations is you know very much towards you know rapid time to value. You're a manufacturer. I'm a manufacturer. 
And so we think everything has to be pragmatic and ROI driven. So we've got you know literally razor thin margins. So every dollar we're going to spend has to have proven ROI. And so we build that into our uh, build that into our thinking. And and we have a portfolio of solutions. So that you know today you know my the, this digital transformation can be this like really big ominous topic. Like oh my goodness, I need a team of people to start that meeting. It's actually not. You know, so and it can be everything from you know quickly plugging into the PLCs and, and in one day you sort of start visualizing OEE and scrap rates so you can make decisions to you know a much bigger and broader portfolio uh, solution. We think about things like MES, and so it is very much designed to get get in, get value, and then allow you to expand regardless of the size of the company, regardless of the resources you have at your disposal. I love that approach and really, you know, there again, meeting a company where they are and and you're right, this digital transformation and the idea is really, really daunting. We talk a lot on the podcast when, and we talk with a lot of industrial employers, small to mid-sized companies that come to us and they say, you know, where do I even start with whatever you want to call it, digital transformation, uh, an industry 4.0 journey, automation leadership, IIoT. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different baskets that we can put this in. And my answer is always, um, you know, use it as a continuous improvement tool. Uh, if there's an opportunity to solve a problem in the same way that we would use Hoshin Conry, the same way we would use 5S in manufacturing, same way we might use, uh, you know, spending time in the Gemba, you know, whatever that tool is, uh, figure out where your biggest challenge is, what's going to kill you first, and then how do we bring technology to bear on solving that problem and educate yourself around Industry 4.0, connected systems, data acquisition, data analysis, and so on. Go a little bit deeper in terms of, let's say I'm a, a manufacturer running a machining company, a, a metal fabrication company, an investment casting company like the one that you were involved in for, for a number of years. And I've got PLCs running my equipment. And to your point, we can plug the solution into a programmable logic controller, start acquiring data and analyzing it right off the bat. What does that experience feel like? What does that look like for the manufacturer? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think the way you, you articulated it makes sense. It's, you know, these industry 4.0 or smart manufacturing, you know, those aren't destinations, they're journeys. And so having a big vision, but also starting small is is important and has benefit. In terms of what it looks like for a customer, you know, we we tend to hear things like, but that's it. <laughs> like that was easy. We were expecting, you know, uh, we were expecting like this really big complex, you know, sort of project. And so the other side is, you know, when you start to visualize um, some of this, you put in the operational control and you start to visualize things like OEE or scrap rates or whatever, you start to see these cultural transformations. And so where it, you expect it to be this big sort of top down thing where it's like, ah, oh, your OEE is, is terrible and your scrap rates are terrible. Like, the people will start to actually change because they now have access to the information. And so, you know, when, when we start to see these types of things, regardless of whether it's a, an OEE solution or QMS or even full MES, and again, quick time, you know, much quicker uh, and less expensive than they expected, getting benefits quicker than, than manufacturers expected, but also like the cultural changes, which are sort of a byproduct are really where, uh, really where we start to see some, some really interesting results and feedback from, from customers. And if you're walking the floor with somebody who's thinking about a continuous improvement project, thinking about where they want to start with improving, you know, whether it's scrap rate, yield, efficiency, uptime, productivity, I mean, whatever that, whatever that target is, the first question I always ask them is how do the people on the floor know whether they won or lost every day? And and every time they'll kind of look back at you and say, you know, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, hey, just think about the question. If I'm working on the manufacturing in the manufacturing facility, operating a machining center, operating a punch press, performing assembly operations, and I walk out the door at the end of my shift, how do I know whether I won or lost? How do I know whether I added value? How do I know whether I did the work that my employer was expecting me to do? And if the the CEO of that company, the vice president of operations of that company, or or the the supervisor in the manufacturing plant looks at me and doesn't have an answer to that question, I know where to start with the solution. Because if the people who are doing the work don't know whether they're productive or hitting whatever target they're supposed to hit on a daily basis, you almost have no chance of being successful. They're the people that are at the end of the day responsible for whether or not we're going to produce quality product and do it efficiently. And if they don't know, uh, that's the best place to start. It sounds like 
your platform in terms of data visualization and in terms of um, providing the people who actually do the work and the, the people who immediately supervise them with real-time information, that that is a key aspect of your value proposition. Am I getting that right? And if so, can you share an example or two of where that solution has helped manifest itself in providing data to individuals on the shop floor to improve the process? Yeah. You know, when we think about what the product that we bring and the product that we build, we really look at the whole of the, the manufacturing experience and what the needs are, both inside and outside the four walls of the shop, right? And so, you know, we think about uh, alignment and goal setting uh, and visualization and operational rigor, both, you know, upstream to the supplier, downstream to the customer, and then inside the four walls. And so, you know, that you know, that aligned goal setting, I think, is one of the key pieces. And so one of the things that we start with is making sure that at the at the upper level, like what are the you know what are the objectives that we should be driving for? What does good look like? What are the targets? And then making sure that that can cascade down not only into things like the reports, but into the communication with the with the operators. And you know the uh, the organization and the people need to understand you know not only what does good look like, did I win or lose today, but why am I doing this in the first place? Like it's great that you know my yields are are changing for the better and they're going more positive, but why? Why does it matter? Right. And, yeah. and so, you know, giving them that not only that, you know, sort of that that benchmark and that finish line, but but connecting them to, to the broader purpose and the broader mission is really, really important. We have, you know, part of that is that we offer is, you know, people have been around the block in manufacturing and so we can help do some of that coaching. But part of that is the tools that we we build. And so to, to your direct question, we have um, Everything from, you know, making sure we're driving, you know, inventory control and traceability and scheduling and making sure that the right operators are at the right place at the right time. But we also have things down to, you know, not only like gauges and tooling and quality checks, but things like continuous improvement and lean capabilities so you can do objective setting into goals and into measures. And so one of the things that, and they're uh, seemingly innocuous sort of pieces of functionality, um, but when you think about it, it's, it's the person who is at the place of work right? Says, hey, I see an issue that if we did this, it will have this benefit or this impact, right? And then it, that submits through a workflow engine and, and you can sort of quantify the impact. And so we have examples where customers have run campaigns using the, the continuous improvement uh, capabilities we have within the software, plus things like employee suggestions, saving tens of millions of dollars. Because, and it's things that you would never assume, like, hey, if you just moved this crate, you drop it off five feet away. I have to go get the part and bring the part back. Get the part, bring the part back, right? Move that closer. Um, my favorite one is we had, uh, you know, there was a, to pop a, a, a part out of a fixture or out of a die, they had sort of fashioned their own, their own tool and it worked, but it was, you know, it would, it would break and they'd have to create another one. Sometimes it would break the product. And they're like, Hey, if you just made this thing out of steel, we already have laying around, it'd be uh, much, much easier. Again, several hundred thousand dollars over the life of the, the program. Um, and so those are real savings and it does a, a couple of things. I'm on a bit of a monologue here, but you know, A, it's real savings to the bottom line, right? But as importantly, back to the culture piece, you know, we're all dealing with uh, labor shortages in manufacturing, but now you've got like, look, we're, we've got a, a workforce that is engaged, which is important. They have a workforce that is aligned, which is important. And a workforce that knows that, that, the leadership takes this seriously and is listening and is implementing, and now they're seeing the results of that feedback. And that so anyway, that's that's part of what we do. But you can do that, but to do that at scale, you need digital solutions, which is part of the the work that we do as we think about continuous improvement and everything from you know really uh, uh, robust quality manufacturing execution, but down to things like like uh, employee suggestions. Everything that I learned in manufacturing, for better or worse, I probably learned the hard way. And there's so many things that, man, if I could have just taken a crash course for six months and all the things that you're talking about, again, going back 20 some years ago when I was starting my career in manufacturing, how much further ahead I would have been. You know, one of the things that I I recognized fairly early on, maybe not as early as I should have, is that you can't solve manufacturing programs from the office or problems from the office. And you, you can't solve them with, with spreadsheets and data alone. And a lot of times we try to do that. You back in from your income statement. It's like, oh my goodness, my labor is too high as a percentage of revenue. And what are the different, you would pull everybody into the conference room and what are the different strategies we could deploy to lower labor costs on and on. 
And it's like, finally, somebody's like, you know, they said, go to the Gemba, which is, you know, for those of us that work in manufacturing, we know that's go to the place of the action. To your point, let's go out where the work is happening, where the person is actually doing the work really, really important. And then once we got out there, one of the things I like to talk about is that back in the old days, you'd stand a group of leaders around a problem and you'd look at it and you'd start talking and it it really, really quickly, it became obvious that you didn't have enough data to be able to solve the problem. And then you'd go find a manufacturing engineer and hand him a clipboard and a pen and a stopwatch and have him stand out at a piece of equipment and watch and gather data and so on. It sounds like so much of that process that was manual back in the day, you're able to automate through your solution um, and automating it through what you're calling software as a service. So two, two part question. The first one is, did I get that right? And are we actually starting to automate a lot of those old manual processes we use for continuous improvement and data acquisition? And, and number two, explain a little bit more about the software as a service model. When you think about software and even you think about continuous improvement, um, there's really two aspects to it. The first is, you know, you put in digital solutions to drive operational rigor to make it hard or almost impossible for people to do the wrong thing, right? So you're driving the behavior check sheets and or Excel spreadsheets rather and checklists and on clipboards, those can only ever follow the process because you're going to fill it in after some work has already been done, right? Uh, so that's step one, but step two is you're driving that rigor and then you're collecting data all the, along the way. And so you can visualize that and say, hey, I got maybe an issue here or an opportunity for improvement there. And so when we think about uh, the products that we deliver, it's very much, let's make it almost impossible to do the wrong thing. Make it easy to do the right thing is actually the way we like to say it, try to take a, a little more of a positive spin. And so that everybody can use it regardless of skill set or tenure. Um, but then we're collecting that information and delivering insight to uh, to the leadership. And then they can bring the team around to go make those, those improvements. And so as part of our quality management solution, we have things like eight D's and five Y's built into the software so that you can, it will drive the behavior and you can, to your point, like, Hey, look, you never solved anything from sitting at your, you're sitting at your desk, looking at an income statement. It it may solve, it may highlight a problem for you, but you got to get out to the floor and figure out where that is. And so uh, we bring all of that, all of that together, along with some of the alignment pieces. Sure. To your question about software as a service, this is one of the things that I still remember when I joined Plex um, 13 years ago now, which time flies when you're having fun. When I saw the the solution, I was like, I was like, I wish I had all of this when I was running, you know, my manufacturing plant because like this solves all the problems. But one of the other, the big problem I had was I had built a solution uh, inside of my plant. It was an on-premise. It was you know sort of, of our our IP, um, but it was built on a technology. And then the the vendor said, we're not going to support that anymore. You're out of luck. And I'm like, I got to start all over again. Like I, I can't start all over again. It's too much money. Sure. One of the things about software as a service and true multi-tenant software as a service is there are no expensive upgrades. Like at, we continuously deploy new functionality literally on a weekly basis, and that is immediately available to all of our customers. And so you can you can click a button and opt into the functionality or, or opt out. Um, and so it's this continuous innovation model because manufacturing doesn't stop changing. Uh, whether it's where manufacturers are are located and the requirements there, it's the products that we're producing, more efficient ways to handle it. You know these sort of trends like labor shortages and and supply chain issues. Um, so we're deploying uh, continuously, and we have this continuous innovation. So that's a part of it. And the other part of it is it it's we're taking care of all of the the tough stuff when you think about IT infrastructure, when you think about security. Uh, we have, you know, we wake up and go to sleep and 24 seven thinking about security uh, and cybersecurity. So we're doing all of that. And so uh, offloading that burden and that risk, frankly, from from our customers, because we can, it's what we do. Right. And so that SaaS model has, has two components to, you know, making it easy to deploy and quick time to value, continuous improvement, but then all of that IT overhead and infrastructure and cybersecurity stuff, uh, we're doing that and doing that in the best in best in class way. And so uh, it adds a lot of benefits to manufacturers on top of you know the great functionality that we're delivering. 
all those challenges we used to have back in the day of a server-based ERP or MRP system and, and all the IT folks that had to be, yeah, worried about all that stuff that you were just, yeah. that you were just talking about. You take all that off the table, which makes a ton of sense. You really piqued my interest with part of that last question that I just want to drill down a little bit deeper into. And for our audience and, and their benefit, you know, when we talk about AD corrective action, it's really looking at a, at a problem and trying to get to re- in manufacturing or otherwise and get to root cause through looking at it through a wide variety of lenses and a a wide variety of aspects. We talk about five why, that's the idea of asking why five times. In other words, that the first time you ask why did this happen probably doesn't get to the root cause. You're you're talking about a symptom, but if you say why did that symptom happen and the idea that you ask that why five times, eventually you'll get to the true root cause of the problem. And then if you attack that, you can fix all of those symptoms that flowed out of that. So great lean tools that we use all the time in manufacturing. You said that your software can automatically prompt and walk somebody through an 8D or a 5Y. Help me understand that. Yeah. So, you know, part of the work we do is like make it out of the box, make it super easy to use. If, if a, a manufacturer has a, a different need, then make it easy for them to create their own, whether it's a form or a template. And so we, we offer sort of both, both pieces of that. And so one of the things we do, if uh, we have forms like, eight, again, 8D, 5Y, and we actually have a couple of others, but you literally, if you have an issue somewhere on the plant floor, it can be from a, an offending piece of inventory, uh, a labor record, it could be from a quality check sheet, you can literally click a button and says, this thing was wrong, and I need to do something about it. And it'll kick up a, an 8D or a 5Y, depending and, and lead the people through exactly what needs to do along with workflow actions and, and assignments and um, you know everything from notes, from meeting minutes to uh, capturing pictures to how we're gonna communicate to the customer to how we're gonna quarantine the material. Um, but, but it's all do, doing that through not only guided forms but workflows that are assigned. So you, again, it makes it really easy to do, the, to do the right thing, but ensure that not only are we making sure that whatever the, the issue is, like don't let any more of it happen, but then let's go make sure that we're we're driving to root cause analysis and making sure it doesn't happen again. And then and then any sort of uh, communication that needs to happen. And one of the other things that we we look at very strongly, and it's it's especially now with the the labor shortage that manufacturers are experiencing, is you need to bring multiple perspectives and viewpoints into those types of things. And so it's a, it's a very much a team based approach. Uh, that encourages, hey, don't just grab the supervisor and, and the operator who you know maybe made a mistake or, or at the machine, but bring in other people from other areas who have different perspectives so that they can see it, they can contribute, see something maybe that you didn't, but also they'll take that learning and be like, hey, look what we're doing over here back into their area of the business, whether it's a, a different product or a different line or whatever the case may be. And so all of that, again, digitize it, we automate it so that, look, take all that you know, sort of administrative stuff off of the place. You don't have to worry about that. And you can use your brain for something a little more more creative than administering a checklist. So you're you're actually vindicating me for all the times that I would invite, for example, an assistant controller into a Kaizen event or a, a CI event. And people would be like, well, why is that person there? Why is the purchasing manager there? And for exactly the two reasons that you just mentioned, number one, they'll bring a perspective and see things that the rest of us who look at this problem every day aren't going to see. And number two, it makes us a better organization if everybody understands continuous improvement. You know, your, your example, Anthony, is really, to me, it's like, uh, it's it's continuous improvement and corrective action in real time. I mean, back in, in the old days, you'd, you'd have a a yield issue, maybe even a customer um, opened up a corrective action or requested one, or you opened one at final inspection because you had a, an, an order that was uh, that had a defect. And now you're saying we do that in process and we can actually do the 5Y or do the 8D or, or whatever other root cause analysis tool we want to put to work. We can do that in real time, capture the data and really accelerate continuous improvement, which is what I'm hearing from you is a huge part of your value proposition as manufacturing continues to evolve and, and not only speed to market, but speed to solution becomes really, really important. You've got that built-in information and that built-in continuous improvement model right in the software, which is really cool. I want to share an example with you. Um, I was at a manufacturing facility, uh, super connected, data-driven, sensor, smart sensor, smart device-driven manufacturing process, um, tier one supplier to automotive. And I was touring their facility about six months ago, highly automated, and he's got data everywhere. And he's got, you know, you can see the operators performing an operation and then looking up at at the screen to see where they're standing and supervisors walking throughout the facility and tracking yield and tracking throughput and tracking productivity, tracking lead times. I mean, all of this information 
in real time. Um, and and I, I said to him, I said, wow, this is a really, really cool MES system. What, what is this? And he said, well, you've heard of Plex system. So he was actually using your software and your platform to do all this. But I was just absolutely fascinated by what I was seeing and on that topic of really, really tailored demonstrations and specific applications of, of advancing technologies. I want to turn our discussion now to uh, the Connected Systems Institute and give you an opportunity to highlight that partnership a bit. I think our audience uh, certainly is familiar that I'm, I'm on the advisory board for that organization uh, doing really great things with connected systems and advanced manufacturing industry 4.0 technology in Southeast Wisconsin. So talk a little bit about that partnership with the Connected Systems Institute, highly Rockwell driven. Fanuc has a huge place there. APT Manufacturing Solutions, certainly very active there. Microsoft. Uh, tell us about Plex Systems' role in that initiative at, in, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Yeah, and it's it's like one of the things that's super exciting about being a part of Rockwell now is we have these opportunities, you know, to give back. And and part of the way we we look at what we're doing is, you know, we want to you know automate uh, away you know standard processes where it doesn't require you know a person to do that stuff. So it's like, look, take the mundane and the routine or or the unsafe, augment you know where we can skilled labor, and then likewise create the next generation. Of, of manufacturing uh, and manufacturer and, and really champion sort of this cause that manufacturing is not this like deep, dark, dirty place where, you know, things catch on fire and you, you, you come out looking like you just left a, you know, a, a, you were in the mines or something like that. And so there's just this, a lot of this work that we're doing. And so one of the things that's really central to us is, is giving back and building that next generation. And so uh, one of the things we're doing with Connected Systems Institute is we have put in both our software as well as uh, services to do implementation so we can run the line that they have there and, and drive everything from, you know, MES. Uh, we're working with their students to drive integration to the to the SAP instance that they have, but also driving down uh, into the PLC and the PLC control. The thing I love about CSI is it's very much focused on the students and enabling the next generation of, of manufacturing leadership. But it's also a place where manufacturers can come to learn about smart manufacturing and industry 4.0. And if they're thinking about transforming their business or maybe having struggles, it's sort of a, you know, an oasis to come in and learn a little bit and learn that it's not as uh, daunting or as difficult um, and get some help. And so part of that, it's a big part of the work that, that we've done and, and uh, have gone live with all phases of that, that project just recently. And so we're really, really excited and, and really excited that it was student led and student driven. Right. Um, so we're building not only skill sets around manufacturing and manufacturing engineering, but this sort of systems approach and uh, data insights and, and learning. And so uh, really, really excited about being able to give back to the big deck, to the community and help build the next generation of manufacturing leadership. It's going to be fascinating to see how your technology is manifesting itself there. I think I'm due down there in the next uh, month or so to, to take another look at all the great things happening at the CSI. So really, really cool example. And to your point, it really does serve a lot of different purposes. The, the last of which is exposing all of these, especially small to mid-sized companies to advanced manufacturing technology and industry 4.0, but also inspiring that next generation of students around how amazing careers in advanced manufacturing are. So Anthony, I have to ask you this question. You have such a fascinating background. We talk a lot on the Tech Ed podcast about how we can start off in a career in manufacturing and it can take us so many different directions. You are the perfect example of that. The perfect example to a high school student, a technical college student, somebody coming into the workforce of advanced manufacturing. You started out working in hardcore manufacturing. You were running an investment casting operation, and now you are the vice president of product management for a major software company. How does somebody go from point A to point B, take us through that journey. For me, I think manufacturing is a, is a very, very special place. Um, and it's one of those things. My uh, I got put to work at a very young age. Um, literally, my first job was uh, was shoveling steel because it was like, hey, you need to understand what hard work looks like. And then likewise, you know, make sure that you um you know, don't understand the value of a, of a good, of a good education, but that, that's sort of the, the people I was working with when I was, uh, you know, just, just shoveling steel. I was like, man, these are some of the most interesting, most interesting people. And, and the way I sort of articulate it is, you know, manufacturing is this great place of innovation, um, but it's a place of first starts and, and even second chances. So like I, I just got started because if you can read between the lines, I was a little bit of a, a little bit of a handful 
in my uh, in my earlier years, and it was like, hey, uh, I'm gonna, you know, you need to learn a few lessons. Um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and so you know, I, I worked my way through uh, a variety of different roles and put myself, uh, you know, through school and, and came out and was like, I, I love manufacturing. This is what I want to do. And conversely, there were people that I was working with who, you know, didn't have all of the same opportunities that I did, but, um, you know, we're working inside of manufacturing, making an amazing career for themselves and really having a big impact, not only on the business, but on their, on their teams and even their local communities where, you know, they may not have had that, that opportunity anywhere outside of manufacturing. Right. And so like, that's, I think there's something really, really special, really, really special there. But one of the things that, uh, you know, got me to uh, to Plex was love manufacturing, new manufacturing, worked my way around the organization. And I'd always, we weren't a, a giant conglomerate. We were a relatively small company. And so in order for us to compete, uh, we had to act and make ourselves look like and operate like we were much bigger than we were. And we always used software and technology to do that. And so we had, you know, I was building uh, software inside of the company I worked at you know, to connect to the, to the supply chain, you know, we, we pulled in an old, you know, uh, NC from, you know, like, I, I swear it came out just after world war two, but slapped it. It had a, it had a, a touch button control on it. We slapped an ethernet port on it we were able to integrate so we could run that thing 24 seven. And so just doing those types of things, um, to help us be more efficient and to help us compete. And I was, I was reflecting one day, I was like, I really, really like this. Like, there's got to be a job out there like this. Like, I, I would love to do the software stuff and be able to help manufacturers, you know, more, more broadly. Um, and honestly, I, I, was, I was searching and I was looking and I'd heard about some of the other, you know, the big names that were out there, the SAPs and the Oracles, but it didn't have that manufacturing connection. It was just kind of something else that they did. And I came across Plex, which, you know, actually got started in a manufacturing plant that was, you know, just up the road from, from where I was working. Um, and everybody, up the, when I saw the, what we were doing and I, and I met the team, I was like, those are my people, right? And that's the solution I wish I had. And they were like, hey, we're looking for people who like software and manufacturing. That Venn diagram overlap can, is relatively small. Um, and so I joined the team and we were a much smaller company. And so had an opportunity to, you know, work around the organization, um, you know, everything from implementation and support, you know, really driving outcomes for our customers and being close to our customers I had some responsibility in, in sales and growth. Uh, so I, I got, I made my way out to California because as we were expanding, uh, geographically, they needed somebody to come out and help start up an office. And so I moved West and was like, Hey, it's kind of warm out here. I'm not moving back to Michigan. Um, and then ultimately, you know, because of that, you know, that connection to the customers, um, found my way into to product management where I can you know, uh, help drive the, drive the strategy and the vision forward and, and really help our customers, um, use Plex as a competitive advantage. So, a little bit of a winding uh, career path. I'd sure. like to tell you it was all by design. It absolutely was not. It never, is. never is. Just looked for the uh, the hardest problem and where things were the most nebulous and, and least defined. And it was like, I can go, I'll, I'll go do that. And here I am. I love that line about first starts and second chances. I'm going to use that. I'll give you credit at least a few times before I just flat out steal it. But that's a, for it. That's a great, great line. I really, really like that. You know, both of my kids who are now, you know, post high school age, um, worked in manufacturing at our insistence, you know, we, and we said, you don't have to make that your career, but to your earlier point, I want you to know the amazing people that work in manufacturing is in, in my, what my friend, Nick Pinchuk says, the garages and, and factories of America every single day, just unbelievable salt of the earth, people working in manufacturing. And, and, uh, I just love the way you answer that question. Cause you and I share so many different options observations on the power of manufacturing, the power of those manufacturing careers, the importance of exposing people to manufacturing careers, especially in my, my view, middle school and high school students. So we've talked about your technology and how it manifests itself in manufacturing. We've talked about its applications at the, at the Connected Systems Institute at the university level. Are there applications for what you're doing in, in high schools and, and how should we be exposing young people to the technology? Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. And I think, you know, the more, uh, the more we can drive education and awareness, um, I think the better off we'll be. If you think about, you know, uh, just, just shop class, right? I think the thing I remember most about, about high school is calculus, because I, that was really, really tough for me, and shop class, because I learned the most. 
And I think there are great there are great opportunities. There's um, actually in, in Wisconsin, there are high schools that have built manufacturing businesses to teach kids not only about, you know, it's like shop class plus plus, you know, this is what it looks like to run a business and everything from accounting and finance to, you know, to the marketing, to the to the team leadership. Um, and a component of all of that is, you know, not only the hard skills that you learn, but also how to interact and leverage technology is, is not only a, a thing to do and a skill to understand, but what you can use that technology for to drive change. Um, and I think it, you know, underpinning all of that is it helps you be more comfortable with change, uh, which is a, you know, a constant in, in accelerating these days. And so I absolutely Absolutely think there is. Um, it is one of the areas we're looking uh, looking at diving into next is, you know, scaling out what we've done with uh, with the CSI initiative. It's amazing how technical education and, and now technology education has evolved to, you know, to your point from what used to be shop class to then technical education. As we close up our time with you today, Anthony, we've had just a really great conversation. I'd love for you to touch on uh, one last question. And that is, you know, if you think back to uh, the 15 year old Anthony Murphy and uh, all the things that you've managed to learn and all the things that you've managed to to do since you were a, a, a sophomore in high school, for instance, if you could give a piece of advice to that 15 year old or 16 year old you, what would you wish that individual had known? This is advice that I give to, uh, to, to anybody who asks who's, you know, whether in high school or trying to figure out their, their career. Um, there's sort of four or five things. I've, I've never been one who's been short for words. To the point you, you mentioned earlier is, is learn to build. What learning to build something teaches you about systems thinking, and it teaches you about how to get to root cause and, and really get to the root of a problem. And I think that's the number one, uh, the number one skill set. Um, I think the other is, you know, it's all about people. And so be patient and kind to yourself and to others and, and go together and go take others with you. I think the second big skill set that you can have in, in life is, is understanding how to work with and, and align across uh, different groups. The third piece that I, that I say is like, look, I'm not particularly special in any way, shape or form. Um, I think my, my greatest gift is that I got a thick skull. And so I'll just run into to anything over and over again. But so go do the hard stuff and the stuff that, you know, everybody else is afraid to do or sees as too risky. If everybody else is walking away from it, it's usually a good uh, indication that you should walk towards it. And then the last piece is, is that uh, you've got this, right? And, and you can absolutely do it. And the journey may be circuitous and it may take you longer than you would like. And it may be unclear at times, um, but you got it. You can handle it. And, uh, and you'll, absolutely, you'll absolutely get there if you, if you think about how to build stuff. If you think about going together with people and you think about looking for the, the things that nobody else really wants to do, I think you can have a really great, a really great career and a great career path and do big and important things. Terrific answer to that question. You know, we we ask it often and, and it, it runs from really well thought out answers to to cliche ones in some cases, and yours were absolutely, absolutely perfect. We have had such a fascinating conversation today with Anthony Murphy, the Vice President of Product Management for Plex Systems. We have talked about education. We've talked about higher education. We've talked about how his product goes to work, improving the processes of manufacturers, large and small. And we have talked about his fascinating professional journey and his advice for the 15-year-old Anthony Murphy. Anthony, thank you so much for taking time for us here on the Tech Ed Podcast. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week.